exciting. Huh? <laughs> I wonder if they're going to do like time limits. I wonder, yeah. Uh, like last week. Yeah. Um, you want to keep it in the Zoom room? Yeah, let's keep it in the Zoom room. We're going to go where we have attorney Robert Keogh, um, who was uh, part of a panel, an informational hearing on this very Bill 112 that we've been discussing. Uh, and I think it was kind of, uh, it was a point-counterpoint kind of thing with attorney Mitch Thompson. Um, and so we wanted to bring on attorney Keogh on this, the day of the second uh, public hearing on uh, Bill 112. Uh, and I guess we'll just get right into it, uh, Robert, uh, if you could. I know that um, I had heard that you were a little taken aback by the backlash and maybe the tone of yeah. some of the, the criticism and the controversy surrounding this measure. Yeah, that there is a tremendous amount of misinformation that is being floated around. Uh, I'm not much of a social media guy, um, but people keep sending me copies of emails and posts and things where um, people like uh, like Dr. Shea, for example, say on his page, Speaker Terlahi and Taylor have zero clue on how to improve healthcare. And then, I mean, that, that makes it a contentious, argumentative process um, ang with anger and, and uh, angst involved in it rather than facts. And uh, I, I'd like to point out what the facts of this cir circumstance are. Um, without any doubt, the law right now requires before anybody can go to court on a medical malpractice, medical negligence claim, uh, you have to go through uh, an, an, a, a preliminary mandatory arbitration process with either the American Arbitration Association or some other association. Of course, there's none on Guam that do it, so it's all off island. Uh, I am the only one that has, a, has had experience going through one of these arbitrations on behalf of a client, and it cost them just for the arbitration $47,000 to have their case heard by three arbitrators. That doesn't count expert witness fees, deposition fees, attorney's fees, anything else. It was just for them to have the American Arbitration Association appoint three arbitrators to hear their case and try their case. It cost them $47,000. And that was just their one half share. Uh, the defendants in that case, it was the SDA clinic. They also had to pay their fair share, which was that much, if not um, more, considering that, that they had their own costs, attorney's fees and expenses on it. So it's a very expensive process and it, and it deters people from, from bringing on um, any kind of a malpractice claim. And you don't know you're a victim of malpractice until you are one. Uh, it's not something that happens often and it doesn't happen to all of us. Um, but you don't know you're a victim of a car accident until you have one either. But what I'd like to point out is that there are three major differences between the law that, that um, Speaker Terlahi has introduced, Bill 112, which has caused all of this outcry from the medical community, and the current arbitration law. The three, the three differences are, one, the, the, the Bill 112, which instead of using an arbitration, a private arbitration where you have to pay for it, it uses a magistrate judge, a judge of, um, appointed by the uh, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, um, vetted and, uh, and approved by the legislature. These are experienced uh, lawyers, judges. Uh, so it uses a magistrate screening instead of having to pay for three arbitrators. The magistrates are government of Guam employees. They're paid by a salary from the government of Guam. So the, the three major differences are the magistrate screening process under Bill 112 is confidential. As soon as you file it in court, it is sealed. It's not open to the public. It is a confidential proceeding. Under the current arbitration law, there's nothing confidential about the arbitration. Anybody can talk about it to any extent they want to. Uh, it, it's not a sealed um, confidential process. Under the magistrate process, it will be. Second, the decision of the magistrate in the in the Bill 112 process, whatever that decision is, if either party decides they want to go 
onto court, which you're allowed to do both in the arbitration law and in this magistrate screening law. You can go on to, to court for a trial because our constitution guarantees a right to a jury trial uh, on any case with a value of more than $20. So if either party decides to go uh, on appeal to court in the, from the magistrate proceeding, the decision of the magistrate is admissible evidence in court. Under the arbitration law, the decision of the arbitrators is sealed. The jury never hears about it. It's not admissible. So those are, are two things that seem to me would favor, would, would make the medical community want to have this kind of change in the law. The third difference is that they, 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 the thing that the magistrate process does is it removes the prohibitive costs of arbitration. The, the arbitration costs of like the case I had of $47,000, uh, that doesn't happen anymore. So the only difference is that you don't have to pay so much to have your case heard. So that's what the medical community is upset about is that it's not going to cost people a, a, an exorbitant amount of money to uh, have their cases heard. That's what it's all about. And all of this acrimony and anger and, and uh, misinformation that's, that's being floated around is not only unfortunate, it, it's, it's disastrous because uh, this, this law needs to be changed. There are so many people that if they've ever been a victim of malpractice, they just can't do it because uh, they can't afford 47,000 or any, you know, even 10, 20, 30,000. Mm -hmm. You can put up that kind of money to have a case heard. So th those are the, are the three major differences. Robert, uh, what, what do you make though? Because when you just kind of look at the writing on the wall, I mean, it's some big writing. You have the governor, you've got pretty much every medical professional opposing this bill. I haven't seen a single white coat come out and say, yeah, this needs to change. You know, patients need to have access. Um, and I understand that, you know, some people talk about greedy lawyers. Some people talk about greedy doctors. But when you have, again, like I said, just the amount of opposition to this bill, at what point do you kind of think, well, I mean, is there something here? Because they can't all be, yeah, there is you know, something. greedy doctors, or is it is that what it is, that it's being orchestrated, this huge pushback? This isn't a question about greed, greedy doctors, greedy lawyers. It, it's a question about access to justice. Um, yeah, I suppose th there probably are some doctors who would say, yes, this needs to be uh, corrected. They're not going to be come out, come out publicly on it because they'll get um, criticized from their own members of their own community. But uh, the opposition to this bill has been based on misinformation. Uh, for example, um, the doctors say, we're going to have to stop providing uh, specialized care because if we don't have a specialist on Guam and uh, we as, let's say, a, a family practitioner um, is, is going to be called upon to do some kind of a specialized treatment, that they won't do it anymore for fear of being, being sued. Well, if they're doing it right now, um, what's the difference of doing it um, in the future un under this law? The standard of care remains the same. The standard of care in the old law and in this, well, the current law and the Bill 112 states, the prevailing standard of duty, practice, or care by a reasonable physician in the same field practicing medicine in the community at the time of the alleged mal malpractice. So the standard of care is the same and informed consent is the same. So if a physician has a as a patient who needs specialized treatment and the physician says, I'm not the, the best person to do this. You need to go off island to have this done. And that person says, I can't afford to go off island and my insurance company won't pay for me to go off island. And the doctor says, okay, well, I can do it because I've done these before. Uh, and do you agree for me to do it? That's called informed consent. And if the patient agrees to it, then there's no liability that would attach to that because they've been informed of the risks. So that's just, it's, it's a non-issue that the medical community has raised. 
um, about specialized care. And doctors are saying they're going to close up their practices and leave. Are, are they really going to close a lucrative practice because people can now access just, uh, justice, can access the courts, can access a, a screening process without having to pay $47,000 to have their case heard? I mean, it just it doesn't make any sense. Can, can you kind of clarify uh Expert medical witnesses will be hired by each party and their testimony presented to arbitrators, mediators, or magistrates, just as is done in the current arbitration process. On, on any malpractice case, both parties, both sides, would hire medical experts uh, to give their opinions. Before any person can bring a claim for medical malpractice, they need to have an opinion from an expert that says, that the treatment that was provided to them was below the standard of care and that um, they suffered injury as a result of that below the standard of care treatment. That, that's one of the criticisms that I have of even having uh, Chief Justice Carbolito come out and weigh in on this, which I thought was incredibly inappropriate for a the Chief Justice of our court system to, to weigh in on a, on a policy-making issue such as this now at this time and saying our magistrate judge justices aren't trained to be able to handle these kinds of cases. No judge has been trained. No judge, there's only one judge that has handled a medical malpractice case in the last 30 years. And I brought that case to trial and went to a jury trial. Because of this arbitration process, there have been none have been filed in the Superior Court in the last 30 years. There has been one. And uh, Judge Canto was the judge on that. He hadn't heard a medical malpractice. This was a dental malpractice case. He hadn't heard it before, heard one before, but he does what he did what judges do. They study, they read cases, they listen to the experts, they listen to the arguments of the parties, and they make informed decisions. Um, what if a, if a case came in front of the court involving nanotechnology or something? Do any of our judges know anything about that? No, yeah, of yeah, course not. Yeah. I don't either. I'm not even sure I know what the term means. But <laughs> If I had a case like that, if I were a judge and I had a case like that that came in front of me, I'd study it. I'd learn it. I'd read the, the case decisions on other cases yeah. that have been decided. I'd read literature on it. Um, it's, it's, what, it's what judges, it's what the parties do and what experts do. They educate the court on the issue and the court will make the decision based upon what he or she deems to be a fair outcome. Yeah, I thought that was interesting, uh, Robert, because in the public hearing, um, it, it was the daughter of a judge, I believe, who was raising all these concerns about how judges are so unqualified to hear. Um, but you're right. I mean, judges decide on things that they're not trained in. I mean, every single day today, a judge will probably weigh in on a case where he doesn't have any formal training on on what could be the um uh, subject matter, but just going back to the arbitration. So, if the part, if this bill were to become law, and um, you you were my doctor, and we and I was the patient, and we agreed to go to arbitration, and I had you know forty seven thousand dollars to pay, that still holds. But if I didn't, would I then go before what the magistrate judge and just present everything and let them make a determination? Can you kind of maybe clarify that part of it? Sure. Uh, once a case is filed, I mean, right now you can't even file a case in court. You have to go to arbitration first. If you do file a case in court, it gets stayed under the statute. They'll, they'll, they'll stop it. They'll stay it until you do arbitration. Um, but under Bill 112, if you file a case, it immediately gets sealed. Uh, it becomes confidential. Nobody can access it. And you go in front of a magistrate judge in a closed um, proceeding and you, depending on how the how the parties uh, present their cases, they're going to have to um, go before and have a hearing in front of the magistrate judge, and the magistrate judge will decide is there merit to the case or is it a frivolous case. Um, frivolous cases, frankly, don't get filed. I mean, if, if a lawyer is taking a case on a contingent fee, which means you're going to take a percentage out of the recovery, well, why would a lawyer take a frivolous case? Um, you're not going to spend your time so that you know, you ultimately will lose that, that that's a, a fool's errand. Um, but anyway, under the magistrate process, the magistrate judge will listen to the evidence, listen to the experts, 
and make a decision based on one, is there merit to the to the claim? And two, if so, was there injury? And three, if there was injury, what's the value of the injury? And he or she will issue a decision. And the parties then will either accept that decision and you know, if, if it's in favor of, of the plaintiff, let's say they award them $100,000. If the defendant says, okay, I'll pay you the $100,000, that's the end of the case. If they award the, the plaintiff $100,000 and he says, that's not enough, my case is worth $500,000 and he decides he wants to, to go to trial, he has the right to do that and go and have a jury trial. But the decision of the magistrate saying the case is only worth $100,000 becomes admissible evidence um, either way. So um, that, that's, the, that's the process under this law. It's a very simple, it hasn't changed much at all other than it's not going to be so expensive to, to go to arbitration. And I'm sure that's what the doctors are afraid of, is that it's not going to cost people 47,000 or more to file a medical malpractice claim. Um, they've been protected in that regard for the last 30 years. Um, I was just looking at the court calendar uh, for this for today, and I noticed that do um, you have a case this morning representing uh, Mr. Lubowski and uh, Christine Simbahan? Yes. Can you tell it's us? Scheduled for a status conference at, at uh, or a pretrial conference at ten o'clock today. Mm -hmm. Is this a medical malpractice case? It is. Mm -hmm. okay. Can you tell us a little bit about? Um, the case? Uh, yeah, I don't really want to talk about my clients' cases, but um, mm -hmm. it is a government claim against the the, uh, uh, the Guam Memorial Hospital, and yeah. it's not covered by this arbitration statute. It has nothing to do with the Bill 112 or the current arbitration law. It's a, it's a government claim. Okay. So what would you say to those? That, and that was another criticism I saw, Robert, was that, oh, Attorney Kyo stands to, you know, make money if this Bill 112 passes because the lawyers are going to be representing. Uh, I mean, it's a common criticism all over. They say, oh, Speaker Therese is a lawyer. This is, you know, mm -hmm. written by the lawyers. The lawyers are going to get rich off this. You know, that, that's, a, that's a funny comment because um, lo lawyers' fees are between the the lawyer and the client, whether or not they're even going to charge anything for, for what they do. And lawyers' fees in these kinds of cases and all injury claims are have been limited by statute to 10% of anything over 100000 So uh, it's not a get-rich sc uh, scheme by any stretch. Uh, lawyers' fees in the states are 30 to 40% of whatever you recover here. It's 10% by law, uh, and I follow that law. So uh, this is not a question of lawyers getting rich or, or doctors getting poor. It's a question of whether or not individual people who are the victims of malpractice have access to compensation, to justice. This is for the people of Guam. It's not for the doctors, for the lawyers. It's for the entire population. The, that, that, that's a, that is a false criticism of this statute. It doesn't change any of that. The attorney's fees would be the same under the arbitration law. The attorney's fees would be the same under under this law. That's set by a different statute altogether. What did, what did you make of there was, I want to say it was Dr. Jolene Ogun who had testified and a, a couple other doctors. They talked about the existing ways that a patient can, uh, whether it's, you know, filing a complaint with the medical licensing board or um, settling with the doctor or the government claims act right so while we hear that the medical arbitration is cost prohibitive and the only way to go um these doctors were talking about maybe beefing up the existing uh routes that that patients have what was your comment on, on that because i mean you're bringing a case with the government claims act right now yeah the government claims act only applies to government employees, doctors who are employees of the hospital, doesn't apply to any of the private uh, physicians practicing on Guam. So the Government Claims Act has, has nothing to do with this. This isn't being changed. Bill 112 doesn't change the Government Claims Act. That stays as is. Um, as far as the licensing boards, 
the only experiences I've had with the licensing board is, is that they, they don't handle these cases. You know, um, we've had one, the, um, the trial that I mentioned to you that we actually went through in front of, of Judge, uh, in front of Judge Canto was a dental uh, malpractice claim where uh, we actually won at trial. The jury awarded the, the plaintiff money against a practicing dentist. Uh, it has been years that it, that the complaint that that patient filed in front of the dental board uh, has been pending. It's never been decided. They just could never get a quorum. They couldn't decide what to do. Uh, these boards don't function. I mean, there, there's uh, litigation right now to force the, the medical board um, to uh, comply with the law to produce a website that lists what uh, what doctors have ever been um, accused of malpractice or have settled malpractice. They've never done it. It's been on the books for years. They just don't do it. Um, so eh, it's a little bit too little too late that the doctors are now saying, we'll use the, the medical boards. They've been totally ineffective uh, uh, since the time they were created. I don't know of any example of a medical board ever taking the license away from a doctor or a dentist. If there have been, it hasn't been made public, and I'd love to hear about it because I don't think it's ever happened. Okay. As opposed to to lawyers, the, the the legal community has disbarred many many lawyers for unethical comment. The lawyers do self police. The doctors don't self police. Oh, thank God, doctors! <laughs> did you say? Did, um, did yeah. I hear you correctly that there is a lawsuit regarding the uh, Patient Protection Act and the lack of implementation? My understanding is there is yes. There's oh. a uh, there's a mandamus action uh, trying to uh, get the the uh, medical board to do what the law requires them to do. Wow. Yeah, I'm not involved in the lawsuit, but I, okay. I have heard. <laughs> okay. Who who's do you know who it? Uh, I don't want to say. Um, I don't want to say on the air. Uh, okay. I'm sure it's searchable in the in the superior court okay. uh, as far as what cases have been filed. Um, but there is a mandamus action pending right now. Okay. Yeah, just I think it's in front of Judge Barcenas. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Robert, thanks for your time. It's been uh, insightful. Mm -hmm. Okay, anytime. I'd be ha happy to talk about this because I, I find the misinformation that's out there is, is um, so unproductive and uh, damaging to this community to, to uh, have this kind of vitriol. I mean, even one of the doctors has is now refusing to provide medical care to a, a member of our legislature because of her sponsoring this bill. I mean, come on, wh where, where does that come from? You're, you're, you're supposed to do no harm and then you, you, you stop providing care to somebody who needs care because of a political position they've taken makes no sense thank you robert thank you okay we'll see you anytime have a good day okay 924 uh wow. that was interesting yeah it was uh, i didn't know there was a lawsuit for the well guess what now we know okay yeah. and so this uh this is the law that was uh introduced by the current vice speaker of the legislature senator tina munia barnes mm -hmm. the patient protection through information act and that was signed into law in september of 2011. wow so it's been 10 years this law has been on the books and what the guam medical licensing board and correct me if i'm wrong but they're supposed to be posting on their website exactly what um let me pull it up thank you uh, uh, board shall disclose to inquiring member of the public within four working days, which shall include via the internet information regarding any enforcement actions taken against a licensee, including a former licensee uh, by the board by another state board or licensing jurisdiction. It should include restraining orders, interim suspension orders, revocations, suspensions, probations, limitations on practice ordered by the board, including those made part of a probationary order or stipulated ag agreement, public letters of reprimand that have been issued, infractions, citations, or fi uh, fines imposed, civil judgments in any amount, whether or not vacated by a settlement after entry of the judgment that were not reversed on appeal or arbitration, uh, 
All settlements uh, in the possession, custody, or control of the board shall be disclosed for a licensee if there are two or more settlements for that licensee within the last 10 years, except limitations on that disclosure. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I guess it looks like everything and anything yeah. against um So even a like a complaint that's filed and not necessarily adjudicated? Because it kind of sounds like this is something we've been talking about. It Public kinda letters you're talking about. Oh, wow. Yeah, restraining orders, interim suspension. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, they actually don't even have a website right now. Because I Googled it, and you go and click on it, and it's mm -hmm. like there's nothing there. That's 2011. Is that 10 years? That's 10 years ago, That's, Bridge. 10, years, That's yeah. 10 years ago. I don't know if I had a I know a we passed. followed up on this a few times yeah, exactly. over the past few years, and wow, it still is not... <laughs> I wonder if Vice minute. Speaker was ever like, hey, you dog, you guys didn't do that website? So, I don't know. We'll uh, find out who's taking who to court and what the deal is. You uh, know, in, in Oklahoma, when I was working, and this was over 20 more years ago, I was working at a <laughs> TV station in Oklahoma City, and there was a reporter that she did a whole series called Discipline Doctors, where um, the board mm. there was supposed to be filing um, similar reports, right? And then yeah. it's supposed